Introducing Portraits and Ideas. I'm Earl Ernest Gow, presenting interviews to inspire and perhaps unveil something new in the realm of ideas. So we are today going to meet uh, Professor Boon Oi. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, he is a professor of electrical engineering. Electrical engineering at Kaus, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. Uh, describe your professional position at Kaus. Well, um, uh, my my position here is a full professor in electrical engineering, and I'll be conducting. Um, Tonics research. Tonics basically is a research field that's dealing with generations and detections of light uh, at cows. Okay. Uh, we'll go into some of the technical uh, ideas of your research a, a little bit later. Uh, prior to that, uh, I, I would be very interested in some general comments that you might have on advice that you would give to youth in Saudi Arabia to promote their interest in pursuing sci science careers? Well, in fact, science is very interesting because we make things, we improve things, and also improve the quality of life um, um, in many ways. For example, the internet that we are using is basically um, the advance of tonics uh, um, research and engineering. Um, for example, when you log on to um, high-speed internet and basically using the tonic technology um, all the signal that we receive is in optical pulses so it's in light pulses for example and um, we know that light can travel very fast um, so all the, all the optical pulses will be decoded into signal and then um, um, so that you can you can you can you can you can download or being able to get information from internet, for example. That's one, one of the um, things. And also in medical field as well. Um, optical technique has been used in, in biomedical imaging uh, and detections and, and sensor and etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so in imaging, for example, that has to do with uh, enhancing our diagnostic capability exactly. uh, in medical practice so that we can detect diseases earlier? Exactly. Yeah. This is one of the applications. And another application basically is, for example, um, when you want to examine your retina, retina is the inner layer of your eye, um, the doctor usually uh, will shine a beam into your eye and this light is not even visible to your eye to map the uh, tomography, basically you get the 3D images of your, of your retina uh, through this very simple method uh, rather than have to remove your eyeball for example and then cut into half to get the uh, retina layer. So this is one of the, the, the way that uh, uh, enable doctor to look into your eye without um, doing further harm to your, to your eyeball. Without invasive uh, techniques or, or That's procedures. Right. That's right. right. So um, it's what I call as using light technology mm -hmm. or photonics or optics technology to, to improve. Um, um, so how would this connect this now to our student out there who's listening and contemplating a career? Uh, why would they be interested in this as a career? I mean, well, if, if a student what, what is, makes it exciting? Well, if a student is interested in creating things and try to explore wild ideas, I think science and technology will give you a, a, at least a knowledge platform to do so. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, you, can, you can do many, many different things. Um, um, mm -hmm. As long as you have this idea of exploring things, you can basically use the science knowledge mm -hmm. to explore. Mm -hmm. um, how did you reach the position you are in today in your uh, profession? Uh, please outline your career and explain the milestones in your educational advancement to the PhD. Right, long story. Um, because I'm quite old maybe. Um, well, um, I begin my education, early education, well I did my early education in Malaysia. Um, when I was small kids, I, my, my father was a mechanic, so I always look at my, my father to make things and try to fix things. So I was very, very interested to, to, to make things and, and fix things as well. Um, my 
father was quite shocked actually when he fixed this big, big truck. Uh, had to crawl into underneath the, the, the truck and open out the engine and etc. I think that this is all fascinating and I'm uh, always thinking that when I grow, grow um, um, when I, when I, when I, well, I, 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 I want to do something similar as well. Um, Cause I did, I, I, I quite enjoy doing science and uh, mathematics. And uh, after after my high school, uh, I went to uh, Taiwan for a year. And because uh, um, I failed to get into engineering school in Malaysia, Malaysia have this special quota, so uh, it's difficult to get into. Only a handful of university offer engineering courses. So I went to uh, Taiwan for a year before transfer to Glasgow University in uh, Scotland um, to do an electrical engineering degree. And in electrical, when I was still in uh, college, um, I began to learn about this very fascinating thing called laser and semiconductor laser. Semiconductor laser is a very, very tiny device. Uh, we're talking about less than one millimeter uh, in length and uh, maybe less than uh, 0.5 millimeters, half of the millimeters uh, weak, and it will give you very very strong light. Will emit very strong 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 light. Um, so I say, wow! I love to be able to learn more about this field and love to be able to 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 uh, make those by by myself. So I went on to my graduate study only looking into how to make semiconductor laser and how to improve the performance of semiconductor laser. And uh, after, after, after my graduate study, um, well, I managed to get uh, uh, faculty positions in Singapore and I worked there for four years. When I was an assistant professor, I have to look into a future research fractions and I happened to well, future research attractions meaning um, what is needed, say five, ten years down the road. And I happen to develop a photonic integrated circuit, meaning I can integrate many components onto a tiny little chip. Um, that um, made me a small leader in that particular field. And I happen to file several patent inventions and license those inventions to companies. So with those um, licensing fees that, that come with a fees, meaning you get some money through this process. Uh, I thought that I can do the same thing. So I, um, I left that country and flew to Silicon Valley, California to start up my own company. So I run that company for three years, um, also making uh, semiconductor photonics component uh, for optical communications application. Basically, it's for internet, for long haul application from country to country, part of transmissions. Um, that is three years experience in running that company. And after that, uh, um, the company apparently not doing that well because of the uh, macro environment. We tried to make this is basically the whole economy was not doing well. So we closed down the company and I then moved to uh, Lehigh University in Pennsylvania uh, as a faculty member uh, in 2003. And um, when I moved to um, um, Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, I began to look into the same model, meaning what is required 10 years down the road. And I began to look into uh, semiconductor nanostructures, basically look into, a quant look into quantum dot and a so-called quantum dash platform. Quantum dot, you can look at it as an atom. It's a man-made atom. And I thought if we can manipulate the single atom, which is the quantum dot, so called, we will be able to make very useful devices. Right? Say, 20 years later, if we can, say, use or utilize a single dot to make a single component and put all those tiny little dots close to each other, if every single one will give, send out signal and receive, being able to send out signal and receive signal, then we have very, very large density of component, uh, photonic component. Or electronic component onto a single chip. So this is what I'm doing and uh, I hope to be able to continue uh, this research directions uh, at KAUS. Why did you decide to come to KAUS to continue this exciting area of research of uh, quantum dot? KAUS 
well, I share the, the visions. Cows has very, very great visions. And I love the, the environment, the diversity, and also the uh, facility that I'll be able to have. Um, in most of the university in other world, it is difficult to have such a top-notch or state-of-the-art uh, facility under one roof, and Cow is going to have that. Um, and also, I think um, it is a it is very very exciting uh, opportunity, and I think in life you don't you don't you don't you don't have such a uh, that many opportunity to begin something to build something, something entirely new and contribute to 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 the entire the entire uh, institutions and efforts a new institution. And so this, that way. the the idea of building something entirely new. Uh, at Kaos is is the major attraction that brought you to this uh, new university. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And what does interdisciplinary uh, academic structure and research structure have to do with the attractiveness of Kaos? Well, uh, that part as well is is, is attractive because um, although in most of the major university in uh, in America or anywhere in the world, um, um, you can still have the opportunity to interact with uh, people from very different fields. But um, Xinhao is going to be very focused, research-based university, and put a lot of expertise from different um, uh, fields of study and research under one roof and in, close, in, in very close proximity. I think the interactions might become, uh, will, will, be, will, be, will be more efficient. And um, for example, um, Kaos is going to put in a lot of efforts in biosciences and um, my university in Pennsylvania, for example, is, doesn't have a strong department in uh, biomolecular science and also uh, uh, we don't have a medical uh, school etc. So to establish strong collaborations with other institutions is possible but uh, take quite a bit of efforts. But in this case, you can always knock on other people's door and discuss um, um, your problem questions with your, mm -hmm. your colleague. That begs the question as to you, do you see a possible link between your work and the biomedical sciences? Uh, how you can learn from them or they can learn from you or you can collaborate on, on something? Uh, yeah, definitely. We have been exploring several, several uh, possible collaborations because light is needed everywhere. My project, my, 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 my research is basically making light sources, laser, or uh, broadband sources and etc., um, which will enable uh, um, biosciences, uh, colleagues in biosciences, to be able to see um, their, the molecule tissue more clearly. Um, one of the uh, projects that we try to explore is basically using laser technique to understand a living cell, for example. So we want to develop a tool. Um, to look at the living cell and study the mechanism of the uh, cell and, and any processes that might happen inside the cell. That's one of the, uh, one of the things. Mm -hmm. And also, um, even in mechanical engineering, uh, for example, they are using uh, laser to do cutting, to do micro-patterning, to do analysis of the material, and etc. I think there will be a lot of collaborations with mechanical engineering, well, with, with engineering, with biosciences, and all various disciplines in Kaos. Right. You're bringing in another discipline now, mechanical engineering. So right. this, we see uh, the potential for great synergies right. across uh, disciplines, uh, apparently. Right. And this can lead to uh, dramatic breakthroughs in the future, I suppose. Yeah. Well, this is what we hope to see. Sure. This is what we hope to sure, see at sure. Kaos. When you, when you look back on your career, um, what would be the relative advantage of hard work versus a high level of intelligence in accomplishing your goals? Well, I think hard work is always necessary mm -hmm. for scientists or for any uh, research worker. If you don't want to call scientists, scientists maybe it's too high a level. As a research worker, we always have to have to well, hard work is, is, is necessary because in the lab you have to sometimes design an experiment and wait for hours or days or months or years before you can get some uh, result and um, most of the scientists or science workers uh, spend very very long hours working, thinking and um, 
doing compilations mm -hmm. and experiment. So in terms of intelligent, well, I think I'm not very, very intelligent. I do have very, very high IQ, but uh, I, I'm, I'm very hardworking. Mm -hmm. And uh, start from my undergraduates, maybe. Mm -hmm. Uh, during my undergraduate year, I, 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 I remember I only sleep about 4 hours or so per day, per day and I still keep to this habit until today. Maybe after 40 something years, I'm now 42, so uh, I spend about 4-5 hours a day. The rest of the time, I um, have a lot of things to, to work on and a lot of thinking to do, a lot of writing to do and a lot of experiment to design. That's, that's quite phenomenal that, that you have reduced your sleeping hours to 4 hours and, 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 and what has happened in the place of that is, is working on projects and creating new ideas in your field. But of course, we, we still have to, have to promote a slightly balanced life and sure, uh, sure. Uh, Sunday sometimes I have to, have to balance my life slightly with my kids and etc. And I always try to take uh, half an hour or so uh, per day to at least uh, relax and do some exercise. Oh, yeah. well obviously balance is extremely important. Now, clearly, uh, when you look at the impact that hard work has had in your career, it's been quite uh, dramatic in your productivity and so on. Um, so what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that if a student out there has you know, a lack of confidence about being smart, or maybe there are other students who are much smarter than them in class, that that's not the end of the game for them. That, that only needs to be a stimulus to spur them into action to work hard. Is that, is that the case? Exactly. Yeah. Be interested in, in a certain, in, in certain field and then work hard for it. I think that would be the key. And as I mentioned, um, um, I didn't call myself as high, high, high uh, IQ or very intelligent individual. Uh, but I think I spend a lot of time in working. Well, I think humility and being humble is a certain uh, characteristic that uh, you have presented because uh, to have the productivity you had and to have the innovation you've had with patents and so on, uh, that certainly takes a lot of uh, intelligence and, and so uh, we, we see that as you uh, being modest about your abilities. But I think your message to students is very important though, that don't give up because things are difficult uh, and things that might be um, hard to understand, hard work can actually overcome a lot of the difficulties that you might encounter. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, when did you decide uh, to become a scientist researcher? Uh, at what point in your career? What was that stimulus? Well, actually it was in my uh, senior year of my undergraduate. When I made my first laser, I was screaming like crazy in the lab because it was so exciting to see something that is so tiny and then still being able to, to, to give up such high intensity of light. That was back in early 90, uh, early, early, uh, at least in 1992, 91 and 92. They're still very early day for a uh, so-called semiconductor laser. And being able to get involved and make those things by myself and it's very, very exciting, mm -hmm. extremely exciting. And um, How long did that take uh, for you to uh was that one of your projects as an undergraduate? Yes, yeah, undergraduate. In, in, in a physics course or, or in engineering? In, engineering course. Yeah, in engineering and course. So, so how long did that take to, to make that? Well, to make that is not that that time consuming, but uh, the design process is quite uh, uh time. It takes a little bit of time to design the semiconductor laser and uh, to fabricate a set of laser. If you are skillful enough, maybe two weeks, and if not not skillful enough, maybe two months. Mm -hmm. uh, you should be able to, 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 to get it to, to work mm -hmm. if the design is possible. So, so at that moment, when that experiment worked and you were able to see the laser, that really confirmed your long-term career and, and work in this area because it, it gave you such a, an exciting you know, uh, response, if you will, uh, or an exciting feeling about right. your accomplishment that you said, I want to make further accomplishments. Exactly. Uh -huh. yes, yes. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, it's the excitement and you right away fall in love in this field. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You just say that, wow, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. This is really amazing because uh, it proved that the fundamental uh, science, the modern 
physics that you learn even back in uh, high school, middle school, really can be applied to make something useful. Mm -hmm. And um, that component, although it's very small, but you'll be able to drive a bigger technology. Mm -hmm. So right where you see all those things would happen. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, a, that's, I think that's a good inspiration for students because you, know, you can see progress of your efforts you know, when you make something and it works and you say, wow, I can make something else in the future. Right. Uh, how would you describe the creative process uh, you know, when, you are, when you are coming up with a new idea and you've obviously, with all of the papers you've published, come up with many new ideas. Is there a process that you go through to, to create? Read more. We have to read a lot to understand what is the PR, uh, 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 the, the early work. And uh, we have to think more as well and try to project what would happen and what is needed in the future. And then we design our experiment and research uh, accordingly. Mm -hmm. And uh, read. Well, I will not, I will encourage a uh, student mm -hmm. um, at any level. Not only to read science, but you have to understand the um, the entire world and uh, the technology, the economy, um, the global, even go deep into um, different cultures and etc. Mm -hmm. So read more would help. Reading reading widely is, exactly. is certainly is certainly a, a, a major stimulus uh, for for creativity uh, That's right. as as advice uh, for students, as you see it. And uh, anything else? Well, I think can uh, dare to dream or think about something really well. Uh, don't be afraid of being loved. In fact, uh, when I discuss my idea with my colleague, sometimes, well, if it's not too practical to them, they will laugh at me. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, I think this quite likely, I think that, well, fine. Well, um, um, if it is proven to be a good idea, it would happen. And, of course, um, um, sometimes come up with not too practical idea as well, but through discussions and um, through brainstorming sessions and just try and talk to colleagues and exchange ideas, that, that will always refine your ideas and, um, um, and, and evolve into something new. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's, it's similar to an artist right. who has to create a painting or, mm -hmm. or, or write music or, or develop uh, a new um, idea for a novel, right. uh, this, it, 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 this is the essence of the creative process. So even in science, you have that artistic component of, 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 of thinking globally and coming up with some uh, new uh, concept. Science and art is quite similar. Very Does similar. Any creative uh, uh, work, those are quite, right. quite similar in nature. And that makes every day that you go to work an exciting day, so exactly. to speak. Exactly. Because you never know at the end of the day, whether you will have actually created a new idea in your thinking That's right. on, on the basis of that day. So, so how many people in the world have the opportunity to, to work in a profession where every day has that level of excitement? That, that's a rare uh, profession. That's right. Yeah. You make a reasonable living and, um, and they allow, give you a good environment for you to learn new things every day. I think this is an amazing career. That's right. Yeah. So, so, and people will actually pay you to do this. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> to the learn what you what, what you love to learn. That's right. That's right. Uh, what what was the childhood stimulus you had to become a scientist? Um, like, of was, was there an incident of going to a museum or going to uh, uh, see something on TV or read something in a book that all of a sudden you said, "Ah, science is an area that, of interest for me." Well, um, in fact, uh, I was quite inspired by, 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 as I said earlier on, my, my father's career. Mm -hmm. um, he worked hard. He was, a, he was an auto mechanic. Exactly. Right. So there was and a lot of level of uh, problem solving and creativity involved in, 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 in being an automobile mechanic. And exactly. In the United States, if, you, if one, one of the parts uh, is broken, you just replace it with a new part. But in Malaysia, it's a developing country. If a part's broken, you maybe have to engineer it and uh, come with a, a, another way of manufacturing exactly the same part or come up with the alternate uh, uh, solutions right. to fix the problem. That's right. And once you fix it, once you manage to fix it, 
he always feel very very excited That's right. and always try to try to so called boast about it to to, to always, always see I managed to solve this tough problem. That's right. I think, wow, solving problem is actually very nice. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and science engineering basically solving solve problems. the problems exactly. Yeah. It's sort of thinking out of the box. Exactly. Precisely. Uh -huh. uh, what scientist in your youth inspired you the most, and why? Richard Feynman has to be Richard Feynman. Um, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, unfortunately, he passed away um, about 10, 10, 15 years now. Um, yeah, he inspired me quite a bit because uh, from his childhood, uh, when he was a kid, uh, he really learned how to fix a radio and etc. Um, fix radio mm -hmm. uh, for his neighbor and also set up his own lab and at one point set a fire to his lab and etc. So it's somebody that enjoy exploring something new and try to experiment with it. And um, he was also the one who explained um, the reason why uh, the explosions of um, the challenges, the space shuttles. Um, he has been um, editing cover of very, very well, writing very, very good books and, and uh, um, in science as well. There was a, I think there are about three or four volume of those. Uh, this lecture edited by him, I think, mm -hmm. is quite well read by uh, many college students. The introduction to, to physics. Uh, That's right. It was a basic uh, introductory course to physics. That's right. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, tell us about uh, Richard Feynman. You know, w w tell us about his career. Where did he study, right, and, right. and and what was his uh, progression in his career? He did his undergraduate in MIT, and then a PhD in uh, Princeton. Then he moved to. Uh, well, of course, he participated in, in um, the Manhattan's project in Los Alamos lab, and uh, then become a, a professor in Caltech until his retirement mm -hmm. in uh, Caltech. Right, mm -hmm. and he he was apparently also a scientist that loved uh, life. He played the bongo drum exactly, and, and he also was able to um, uh, play a lot of jokes on uh, on his colleagues. Right, uh, right. very clever jokes. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, it was just a fun person to be around. Uh, quite, a, quite a character. Exactly. So he, he was the kind of scientist that, that shows you this balance, if you will, <laughs> that you talked about earlier. Uh, right. Yeah. And um, so I can understand why he might have been an inspiration for you. Not to mention, uh, what was his Nobel Prize? Yeah, he got his Nobel Prize in, I think, in early 70s, mid 70s, uh, in. Uh, uh, the, the so-called QED, quantum electrodynamic, um, um, in the field of quantum mechanics or quantum physics, if you want to call mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. so, Could you explain his, uh, his, his Nobel Prize and what was the significance of his prize, you know, so that a student can understand? Uh, not quite in detail, though, because uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I honestly do not quite understand uh, in detail about, about uh, his, his, his work in uh, QED, because it's somewhat fundamental uh, physics. What does QED stand for? Uh, it's uh, quantum electrodynamic. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, may, may, maybe, maybe we'll not be able to explain So it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a, an expansion of quantum theory, if you will. Exactly. Uh -huh. Basically, it's a field that people now um, looking into it uh, in somewhat hot topic because in, when when he come out with QED, I think it's still basically based on the theoretical uh, um, um, model and theoretical concept. And experimentally, I think a number of people has been looking into it currently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was also the one who proposed this so-called uh, nanotechnology because he he actually stated a, a word or a statement saying that there's a lot of beautiful things um, um, if you look into something small. That's right. Yeah. I remember that, that quote that, that led to the entire field of nanotechnology. Exactly. That's right. So that people right. begin to look into something tiny, yeah. something small, and uh, learn the physics of uh, uh, small uh, elements, small particles and small atoms. Mm -hmm. Molecular assembly. Molecular assembly. That's right. That. Uh, how much time did you spend? You mentioned this already in terms of your sleep. Sure. Uh, how much time did you spend learning the skills that were helped you the most in school, and uh, what were those skills? Well, in fact, skill is actually an ongoing process. I, I'm still learning until today. But uh, 
basically from from school and um, I think since middle school or high school, you have to have to at least be interested in in science and mathematics and it various different. Well, although in 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 current world, if you want to become a scientist, you more or less will have to know uh, physics, chemistry, and biology. So all the sciences um, they are very very important and will set a the fundamental knowledge for your future career. For okay. future career. So you so so, you know, to learn physics, chemistry, and biology, what skills do you need to have as a student? I think when it depends on different phase. Uh, at the uh, um, high school level, for example, um, well, skill sets. Bit, you need some mathematics, definitely. Okay. And um and willing to spend some time to think about a complicated concept sometimes, uh, especially in physics, mm -hmm. um, have to spend a little bit of, of, of those efforts mm -hmm. to understand the concept. I think concept is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Without knowing the concept by memorizing only the equation that will, be, will, will not be that uh, useful. Um, chemistry as well need to understand certain concepts, particular physical chemistry. Mm -hmm. And I understand that uh, biology and um, uh, organic chemistry you need to memorize a lot of different terminologies and uh, remember um, the equations and etc. But uh, in physical science, basically concept is very important. What, what, give an example of a concept that's very important uh, for a student to, uh, to understand. Well, being able to interpret an equations but not memorizing the equation. Let's use a very, very simple one. For example, uh, E equals to MC squared. Everybody know about this equation. And what is the meaning of this E equals MC squared? Right? We know that energy. Energy what? Can be related to um, mass, which is the M. C, C is speed of light squared. Right? So it means that if you can accelerate, if the particle happens to be able to accelerate um, close to speed of light, for example, well, this is C, um, then the energy is huge. Right? Have the high energy if you, if, if you manage to, to, for example, split the atoms. Mm -hmm. Um, of a uh, um, um, split the particle, but well, split the atoms uh, into other subparticles, um, be able to have extract quite a bit of energy mm -hmm. and etc. So this concept need to be understood properly, and also uh, even as simple as F equals to m a. Right? What is F force? What is a accelerations? And what is m and etc. So uh, by not by understanding the the, the concept that will uh, uh, make life a lot easier to appreciate what is physical science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how would you uh, characterize mathematics in terms of a skill and, and, and many students have, um, how should we say, difficulty with higher levels of math in particular. Right. What advice would you give them in terms of getting past those roadblocks that they inevitably will encounter while studying math and progressing up the, up the ladder in, in terms of the complexity. Right, of course I believe that persistence is quite important. Um, uh, if you find certain things very difficult to understand or very difficult to, to, to um, comprehend um, or to learn, uh, be persistent, try to spend more time to uh, understand those. I think persistence is very important in many other things, mm -hmm. not only on, in learning, in doing um, experiment or mm -hmm. to, to to, to do many different things. So by persistence, you mean spending a lot of time on a problem that you, out on the surface, look at and say, well, sure. this is hard, I can't solve this. And some students might give up. Your, your, your idea is, is to, if you spend more time with it, even though it seems tough in the beginning that you can actually uh, solve this problem or get a deeper understanding of it uh, at some point if you put more time in it. Exactly. And also discuss with your peer and, and uh, friend as well that always help. Correct. Rather than keep um, um, digging into those problem and go deep into it without being able to understand it, maybe you can uh, discuss with your friends or maybe um, discuss with the, the professor or your teacher. What about looking at other sources uh, in terms of books and other re references uh, to get another author's point of view? Yeah, that definitely mm -hmm. have also. Mm -hmm. um, 
writing through discussion sometimes is very useful. And mm -hmm. have a, a good uh, uh, teacher to guide you is, again is, is, is also very important. That's right. So that illustrates the importance and science of teamwork, right? That's right. Of, of getting ideas from others and, and seeing their thought processes on, on a given uh, problem. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what circumstances in your childhood would you say contributed the most to you achieving your goals uh, that you have accomplished so far in your career? And those goals, as I might point out to the audience, are considerable. Sure. You have over 20 patents that you have uh, uh, filed. You have uh, 220 uh, papers that you have published. At, 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 a, at a young age in your career, that's quite an astonishing level of productivity. Thanks. So you certainly will have some thoughts uh, on uh, the question that I, I asked. Sure. Well, um, when, when I was a, a kid, um, honestly, I was not from a very, very so-called wealthy family, which can afford to give me everything. And uh, I always have to, have to design my own toys, for example. Um, I make my own gun. Well, that gun is a wooden gun. And uh, we can load in uh, the, the tower very hard. Maybe it's a seat or uh, from a tree. So they can, can then use those as bullet and etc. So you have to design, keep designing all those things yourself, by yourself. And um, I think those, those backgrounds does help because uh, since young, they enjoy making things and enjoy designing uh, new things and try things out, see whether it works. Um, yeah, those are a number of uh, those are background uh, uh, mm -hmm. that I think contribute to my interest and my. So were you uh, able to career. when you made these things as a as a child? Were were those things were just from objects and, and components you found, or did your 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 father go down and buy you a kit uh, that had these components in it? No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Well, in fact, uh, I still remember that I didn't have a proper of uh, a, a proper pair of shoes. Because I share my sleeper. We, we, in, in Malaysia, we have sleeper rather than have a proper... Slippers. Uh, slippers. Uh -huh. And so you uh, shared your sleepers? With my brothers. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Until maybe at about 9, 10 years old, before I had my own parents. Uh, we live in that kind of uh, um, conditions. And so you have to be creative and try to look for things surrounding and um, to design toys out of it. And uh, yeah, those, those, those backgrounds, I think, help quite a bit. Right. Yeah. To especially being creative exactly. and utilizing the resources on hand That's right. uh, to, to, to make whatever you needed to uh, or you, you attempted to. Uh, in my lab, I, I pass the same message to my student. Uh -huh. Look for anything that you can find in the lab and make things happen. Right. So right. uh, that basically right. is science. And in fact, science is not that difficult. It's That's something right. that is quite straightforward. That's right. So at Kaos, mm -hmm. where you expect to find many things uh, in terms of resources right. in your labs, that really will enhance uh, the creative process. That will definitely yeah, yeah. Will enhance. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, definitely. What, what things will you find in your labs here that you may not find in, say, uh, your previous lab? Um, I, I do uh, copy, copy some of the experiments set up for my present lab. In fact, my present lab in, in, in Lehigh is fairly substantial size. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would, of course, uh, add some new toys scientific toys or equipment uh, in my lab uh, to be able to do um, uh, so-called look into a smaller area of material and uh, non-structure so that I can analyze and understand those uh, the physics of the material. Right, right. Uh, you call them toys, toys. what are the names uh, that, that, that we can say okay. for, for one or two of them? It's the so-called SNOM, uh, S-N-O, SNOM, uh, um, S-N-O. Scanning um, uh, near field scanning microscopy and uh, AFM atomic force microscopy and uh, combo uh, force microscopy I have those three capability joined together so that I'll be able to locate um, close to uh, say a few hundreds of atoms of material and being able to guide a laser beam to study those tiny little structures. So they can understand the uh, so-called electronics property as well as optical properties of those non-structures. Mm -hmm. So those are. This is one of the new toys can, that I'm going. Can to that have. lead to the construction of a molecular assembly uh, system? Not or quite. A, that uh, is the um, uh, analytical tool.
two but um, we do we are going to have a two core um, MBE um, molecular beam ataxy which can enable us to grow nanoparticle or nanostructures some example uh, nanostructures on uh, wafers mm -hmm. on semiconductor wafers and grow them exactly as you would like for them to grow you can you can place one atom next to the next atom next not at this time yet uh -huh. this is what I hope to achieve uh, right. in my That's research goal right. but uh, now maybe it's still randomly grow and uh, okay. we hope to okay. be able to come up with a method yes. to manipulate those uh, self uh, random random growth uh, yeah. nano structures and make it um, 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 the so called example uh, structures. That's right. I mean, th that would be a huge advance over, say, for example, when we look at chemistry now, where when we have a reaction that takes place, we are actually putting two solutions together and, right. and there's random uh, interaction of the molecular structures to create uh, the reaction and to and to, uh, to create a new material, whereas in molecular assembly, we can actually block by block right. add atoms to atoms and create our structures very methodically uh, without this random interaction. So yeah, that, 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 yeah that, is, that is the goal. Hopefully we'll be able to achieve those. And, and, and you were saying that lasers and, and the light uh, forces that you use will be kind of um, diagnostic of, 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 of studying these atomic structures so that you can then begin to think about some construction of, yep. of, a, uh, of a nano level assembly device. Yeah, yeah there will be a tool uh, mm -hmm. to study all nano, nano devices right. using laser. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, what were the circumstances uh, that you saw in your childhood as, as the highest risk for you not obtaining your goals? And how did you overcome these potential obstacles that might have come in your, in your, in your way? Right. Um, as I mentioned, I'm not from very well off family. Um, so I basically will have to um, study really hard and uh, hope that I'll be able to promote to the next stage of my, uh, um, my, my career. Was, was that a self uh, sort of uh, engineered uh, motivation or did you get a lot of encouragement from your parents or both? Not actually from my parents because my, uh, I didn't live together with my parents uh, since 11 years old. So 11 years old on, I basically live in another state in Malaysia and my parents work in a state called Kedah which is close to Thailand. Uh, um, but I live in Penang. This is the island. So, stage. so you were living and with your brothers and sisters? Um, I have, yeah, I live with my brother and sister. Yeah, one and two years my senior respectively. Mm -hmm. And um, but I, 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 I sort of think that I, I, I want to do science because of um, honestly, initially, I just want to say that well, science is a very difficult concept mm -hmm. and understand it mm -hmm. so that I can show off to my peer, saying that, well, see, this mathematics, right. although it's difficult, but I solve it. <laughs> so that, that is the, the, the satisfactions. And um, then later on, well, basically, after, when, 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 when you go uh, to a higher level mm -hmm. in high school, um, you basically know that, well, science is basically solving problem and solving problem and you feel good about it. So this is actually a good Did you see it as a, also a route to rise above your socioeconomic status? Uh, and in the future of having, say, a more comfortable uh, house and uh, and be able to take better care of your family, That's did definitely. you see that as a, a way in which that could uh, be accomplished at the same time having fun? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's definitely one of the, the motivations. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's definitely one of the motivations. That you have, yeah. right. Um, what would you describe as your most effective method of studying uh, when you were growing up? Um, well, what, how would you go about sort of uh, taking a book and, and, and looking at an entirely new concept and learning it? Right. Uh, I basically, my method, my method is that I read a chapter, for example, read a chapter of science book, and I'll close the book and then take out my notes, summarize what I learned from this chapter without referring to the books and on my no notebook, and our the first set of notes might be, say, a couple of pages, and 
a couple of days later, I'll be able to summarize into, for example, one page. And uh, I keep doing all the summary until I can string the content of one chapter into a few lines, which can make me remember. So that, that's the method that I use. I'm not sure whether it's effective for everyone else, but uh, at least it's very effective for me. Because, um, for example, I, 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 I use this method to at least pass my exam from high school to university. And um, at university, for example, we have to learn for one year Right. Instead of going for a semester in UK system, in at least the Scotland system, in Glasgow University, we spend one year learning one single course per subject. And um, I usually compile a lot of notes and then string it into a few pages. Before walking to the exam hall for this three hours exam, I'll be able to summarize everything, the whole course, into one page. And before walking into the exam hall, I just throw this page away and walk in. Everything is in my mind, but I think that that, that is quite effective way to, to memorizing things and uh, to understand. Because through writing and through um, um, explaining those concepts using your own words, uh, that will be able to make you uh, understand better. Mm -hmm. That's the technique. That it's I'm like teaching yourself. Exactly. And, and it's it's a it's a, a active way of studying rather than a passive way, yeah. where you just read and try to think about what's in the book. Mm -hmm. You take what's in the book and reproduce it exactly. all together, completely, so that you can know that you understand it without referring to the book when you reproduce it. That's right. That's that's, that's, that's a powerful idea. technique, and and I think any student out there listening to this can really gain a lot of insight. And it will save them a lot of trial and error by using a technique like that. I hope. So. Any other tips? Um, a methods that you use that you know you found over the years as you marched towards your PhD uh, really became powerful tools for you. I think I keep a lot of notebook, and um, whenever I have idea or anything, I will just basically. Um, write down onto my notebook. I see you have a notebook with you right now. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, this actually is my, my, my user. It's not the, the proper lab lock, but uh, I keep diary, for example, and also um, whenever I have any, any, anything, I just... Jot it down. Jot any down idea down. comes up, you, you have a place to jot it down. Yeah, write in such a way that I can understand, but I, 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 I doubt that anyone can uh, read my handwriting. For example, I have a lot of idea, idea, idea. Those are all the idea and... Uh, so you, have, you, have, you, you put the word idea down and then write down a little brief description of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So this, yeah. I, I enjoy doing this. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Then you go back over your notes from time to time and then say, oh, look at that. I, I thought of that a few months ago, but I've forgotten about it already. And look, at it's a great idea. Maybe yeah. I can implement it now. This, this is what I'm that, that happens. Yeah, that happens. So, so you have notebooks going back several years like this. Oh, yeah. Well, I have at least more than 20, 30 volumes of this notebook, lab book, as well as my own diary to, to write down what I think. Is that typical of a scientist to yes. constantly write down? So yes. that, that, that also is a big part and of a scientist's success. Engineer uh, also. Engineers. Uh, everyone will have to keep a, a log book. Although a lot of engineers these days say that they can keep everything in the computer. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think log book is still very useful because it can flip through and uh, can refresh your memory in a right. very quick way rather than have to open the file and try to flip through the file. Well, do you ever put this on a computer? Or, no. uh, you keep it in the notebooks. Eh? You, you haven't really gotten to the point where you would scan it in or... No. Or, or, it, it's or, too, too many to scan. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. It's, it's That's something long. for one of your assistants <laughs> to do for you. <laughs> right. I don't have assistants yet. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, as a professor, you are, you have a secretary and uh, uh, you know, and, and and your graduate students, of course, uh -huh. uh, yeah, will be able to sort through some of your ideas. Maybe they can find something for their PhD uh, uh, thesis or, or, or something. Yeah, some How many PhD students will you have at Kaus? Um, this year, I'm going to have two PhD students. Mm -hmm. But in the past, I trained about 11 PhD in total. They are all in various different places and they are all That's relatively right. successful in their career. So, so you see uh, those students as being amplifiers of you, in a sense. When they become famous, you become famous? Exactly. I hope that they will become more famous than me. Uh, in that case, I feel good also. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, what are the most significant breakthroughs in science that you predict over the next 10 years, okay, exactly. 25 years, and then 50 years? 
it is actually a big question to, to, to answer. And I think a lot of different, different uh, scientists, they have different, different uh, thinking. But I really hope to be able to see um, the, at the molecular level, um, be able, well at least in my field, I dare not to comment on other people, people's field, but uh, in my field in semiconductor photonics, I really hope to be able to see um, a technology that we can um, at least integrate or pack many different components onto a small little chip to perform various different tasks such as optical computing, which is maybe um, hopefully say hundred or thousand times better than the computer that we are using now using electronics. Why? And, well, because uh, if you string everything down uh, in cross uh, proximity, uh, you save energy, and you do not provide need to provide too much power into it, and become very very efficient. Meaning, uh, from one dot talking to another dot, uh, rather than have to uh, have one single component send a signal through the wire to the um, another component, right? So um, that will that will that will increase the speed. Definitely, because um, it's shorter communication path. High, higher density. Higher density, yeah. and, yeah. and, and um, that will save a lot of real estate as well as uh, energy. To and reduce up. heat, reduce heat. Definitely, uh -huh. uh, because our computer these days is so hot, mm -hmm. and um, the chip, the processor that we're using is very, very hot. Mm -hmm. You can even uh, cook. So optical computing. Day. When do you expect that to happen? How soon will that occur? Uh, it, does that have anything to do with Moore's law uh, of, of, of the reducing uh, size in a fashion which is very uh, predictable? It is still at the very, very early stage mm -hmm. uh, to talk about optical computing. Although we hear about this word optical computing for many years now, but it's still at the very, very early stage mm -hmm. because optical component is not as mature as electronic component. Mm -hmm. um, although we know that light travels in the faster speeds. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's still very, very early age. Maybe I'm talking about 15, 20 years down the road before it will happen. Uh, it should happen uh, one day. But of course, computing is only one, one, part, of, one part of it. Mm -hmm. You can use an optical chip um, to replace electronic chips. Basically, most of the um, electronics that we're using and, and many other things. Will Telephones, be computers, television, all those can be uh, chips that are in those devices, we can replace them with what you call optical chips? Yep, if you can replace them with optical chips, then save a lot of energy and uh, become more efficient, faster. And um, um, So that would, be, that would be the, the application of right. a breakthrough in optical computing. Right. So for this breakthrough, you need to do a lot of uh, fundamental research to have fundamental uh, breakthrough in uh, the material, in science, science material, mm -hmm. and uh, the process, how to make things. What would that mean? What would be the implications of, say, a breakthrough like that? And then all of a sudden, we have this transformation into all these devices, uh, optical computing. Would that mean that we could do more computing? We would have more computing power? We would have more, um, we could solve more complex problems with computers? What, what would it mean? Right. Um, maybe I can, I can tell a story. In the past, when we're talking about a simple, say, a few bits of processing capability of a computer, you need to maybe fill up this entire room with a vacuum tube. Now we have a desktop, we have a laptop, which perform thousand times better, or maybe a few million times better than... than the, something that used something to fill up a room this size. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, optical computing can do something better, meaning uh, another 20 years later, um, it will be equivalent to um, the computing capability. Will shrink again. Will shrink again. Will shrink yeah. further. Um, right. um, in fifteen twenty years later, by 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 using optical computing, right. for example. Does that mean that we will reach uh, something like artificial intelligence uh, in the, in the capability of computers, where a uh, computer uh, it would pass the Turing test? They call it. Right. Where, um, in fact, where, which if you have a conversation with that computer. Mm -hmm and it's answering your questions, you cannot tell whether it's a human or a computer answering you. That would be scary. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope that it will not happen in that way. <laughs> because uh, for a machine to do all the decisions and make the decisions uh, on behalf of human, that, that I'm not too sure whether it, it is. I cannot quite visualize that yet, but at least um, in terms of improving quality of life, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, um, 
maybe human do not need to uh, travel that far to attend conferences and we can have real time conference happen everywhere in the world right. and um, we can we can have um, very fast processing capability mm -hmm. uh, to calculate something that is so complex for example a lot of things that we need to model although we look at a single atom single atom is we thought that it's simple, but in fact it's quite quite complicated uh, 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 elements that you need to, to do a lot of understanding, a lot of things that we still, we still do not quite understand yet and require a lot of uh, uh, calculation uh, uh, power computing to understand power. those, computing power right. uh, to understand those things and um, even a galaxy, a universe and etc. Right. We, we don't have enough um, computing power, computing power sure. although we have super computers so sure. Sure. and um, it always needs to, to have more in order to have uh, basic right. understanding of all those fundamental sciences and um, to understand more about mm -hmm. our environment and the science. So that's probably the most dramatic consequence, if you will, this breakthrough of optical computing from your work at KAUS. Right. Would you say? Well, it, it is one of the directions Any, that we uh, hope to... Another direction would be what, for example? Well, I hope to be able to, to um, create a subsystem um, also called the integrated chip, um, um, which can find applications in healthcare, in um, um, biomedical application. Mm -hmm. This is the lab on. It's just called the lab on the chip concept. Yeah, it's yeah. so called system on the chip or lab on the chip exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, concept so that um, even at home you can find out a lot of information, health information mm -hmm. uh, about you yourself. And um, go through uh, optical technique is always very good because uh, it's non-invasive. Mm -hmm. You do not need to, for example, draw blood mm -hmm. or um, have to have to go through any surgery to understand uh, your health state status. Mm -hmm. uh, you can always use a small little tool or small uh, um, equipment or system mm -hmm. um, to check mm -hmm. your health status and etc. So this is something that I hope to be able to do and contribute. So that means that you could have a continuous monitoring system that could be uh, sending a signal to the hospital that would constantly tell the uh, professionals in the hospital setting how you're doing. So if something was became abnormal, they could immediately call you up and say, come in, we need to check you. Yeah, that maybe is the, the slightly longer term, but in the near term is what we call it, near term and long term. In near term, I hope to be able to develop a device. Maybe it's the size of, can be a, a, as small as the size of maybe a pen or something, so that you can, for example, for diabetic uh, patients to check their blood sugar and etc. Uh, or maybe a small tool integrated everything in the pen mm -hmm. uh, to, for example, um, um, to look into a certain part of the uh, tissue. Sure. And etc. to see um, what actually happened mm -hmm. uh, to that part of the, the, the uh, uh, body. Mm -hmm. yep. So that means that, say, if a patient has diabetes, which is a common problem in Saudi Arabia, right. uh, they, they, there would be less chance of complications occurring if we could catch those early enough with a device that you described uh, so that they could have medical intervention before you get more. Uh, uh, how should we say, serious uh, mm -hmm. development of your condition? Um, maybe it's more to uh, the patient's level, meaning to, uh, when to in inject insulin, for example, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and etc. But current method is basically you have to uh, poke your finger mm -hmm. uh, to draw some blood, to test the uh, blood sugar, to see whether you need to inject insulin, which is actually a painful process. But uh, if you have a tool or a small uh, device to um, Detect the blood sugar without 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 uh, breaking the fingers. That that will be uh, um, will ease a lot of pain mm -hmm. from the patient. Mm -hmm. It's at that level first mm -hmm. before going into the uh, 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 the in, uh, the preventions of all those or uh, early detections of all those disease, disease. That's right. And that's right. Mm -hmm. So so clearly, I mean, there there's multiple potentials right. coming from your areas of research, which makes it even more exciting. I mean. There may be other areas that would be possible breakthroughs that you may not be aware of even at the sure. moment. Mm -hmm. Some other scientists in another field can see what your work is right. and say, ha, we can use that. We can do this and, and, and accomplish this objective, which can be uh, an unexpected, if you will, 
right. uh, benefit that might come out of uh, uh, your area of research, right? right. Well, basically at Kaos, I hope to have several different levels. Start from uh, material. I hope to be able to do some study in material, which is optical material. And I hope to be able to develop technology to uh, change the property of the material, either the electronic properties or optical properties of the material, so that people or scientists or other scientists can then build uh, on this platform, the material platform, to make useful devices and components. Mm -hmm. Um, and bring this material platform into subsystem level, meaning mm -hmm. if you can integrate many components, then become subsystem level. Mm -hmm. You can put a complete system into it, then become a system level. Mm -hmm. So this is what I hope to do. Mm -hmm. Start from material and go for the uh, process technology, which can manipulate things uh, on a single chip in a very small area, and then build useful components mm -hmm. on uh, this material platform. Give me an example of how this, and I notice in your um areas of research, you mentioned some link to potential breakthroughs in solar energy. How, how would that potentially impact on solar energy? Well, um, well, this is a, a small branch of uh, the exploratory project that I hope to do. Because currently we invented or maybe discovered a new way of um, growing, meaning preparing those so-called broad gain or broad absorption uh, um, material. Which, is, which we call it as inhomogeneous quantum dash material. So if you have the inhomogeneous is non-uniform. So if you have non-uniform material or this non-structure form onto a, su uh, a substrate, you'll be able to absorb very, very wide spectrum of light. And in our case, we use this material to generate very wide spectrum of light. So light emitted from this material is very wide band. Wide band meaning it covers from um, um, 1 micron or 1.3 micron of light, 1.3 micron is not sens sensitive to our eyes, it's not visible, it's so-called near infrared light, all the way to about 2 micron, uh, micrometers. And we hope to be able to transfer this power technology to absorb color light. Color light basically is the light from, very strong color light from the sun. And uh, if we manage to transfer this into a swing conductor, that means that we'll be able to use this material system to absorb very wide spectrum of sunlight and increase the um, um, the efficiency of a uh, solar cell mm -hmm. um, to produce electricity. Uh, that's correct. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So because we can then convert all this wide spectrum of photons into uh, useful electrons, where we can store as electrical en energy in a very efficient and more cost-effective fashion. That's right. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll sort of photovoltaic conversion now mm -hmm. is more expensive, but this will be a lot cheaper, so to speak. Um, yes, this one, 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 uh, one, one objective, one way, uh, uh, one reason. Another reason is actually um, you'll be able to increase the efficiency of a solar cell quite substantially mm -hmm. by using this method. By what percentage? Um, before demonstrating the device, uh, the material structures, we, we, we then not to come up with a number yet. But um, even if you can improve the performance by, say, a percent of two, that is actually a, a, a huge improvement. Because in some of the, most of the solar cells, people are talking about improvement of, say, a few percent, 0.2, 0.3% sure. of efficiency. But in this case, we hope to be able to get at least a percent of two of uh, uh, Improvement. Uh, improvement. That could mean large amounts of uh, economics. The, if the economic impact of that is is uh, is pretty significant when you look across the uh, the use of solar uh, cells. Right. Yeah. That's right. Um, here's a general question. Sure. What are the most important scientific problems facing the world over the next fifteen years? And what are your proposed methods for solving them? This might take you out of your field a little bit, but just your, I want to see your creative thinking as a scientist. I think this again is a, is a huge, uh, 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 a big, big, big uh, uh, question. And of course I look at the climate change, right? Of course this is not, not, not in my field, but I think climate change become very, very important. And uh, maybe geophysicists or Climatologists. Climatologists. We have to look into this, this big issue. Mm -hmm. uh, after all, we live in this world and uh, we have to at least address those, those, those issues. 
and be prepared be for prepared it. for what will happen to the world. Right. And as I try, I think that 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 I look at those things as very very challenging issue to mm -hmm. uh, 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 challenging issue mm -hmm. facing uh, scientists. Are there any other scientific problems that uh, we need to focus our uh, sort of scientific manpower? Uh, to solve in the world? Yeah, energy as well is another in other directions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, although we we do have enough 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 oil, enough coal, coal uh, to power up the world, but I think we have to move towards the green energy. Mm -hmm. um, although my research is not focused on, on energy, but I think uh, uh, those issues need to be addressed mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, we can address a bigger bigger one, which is the climate exchange of the whole world, and etc. What about food and water? Yeah, that's okay. Although it's in most of the developed country, uh, people do not even worry about water. But uh, actually, the water, uh, clean water source, actually is very, 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 very uh, essential, very, very critical for many countries in developing country. I think include Malaysia, I think, in my country. Um, that that always an issue because uh, food. We have to find a way to maybe produce more food to feed the larger populations in the world and also being able to pro uh, provide clean water uh, to those people. What role do you see education and expansion, say, of education in the world uh, to sort of cultivate new scientific talent, for example? Uh, what role do you see that in, in helping to deal with these uh, problems that are facing the world? I think through education and understanding of um, all these major issues, uh, we're at least uh, um, being able to educate a young uh, group of people or a new, 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 new scientists or new science worker um, to look at uh, all those drastic issues more uh, carefully and hopefully be able to come up with a creative idea and creative solutions to all those main issues. Mm -hmm. And education becomes very important. Meaning you have to uh, understand all those issues, or at least know all those issues uh, since young, maybe start from elementary school, and uh, keep telling them that uh, those are issues that are facing uh, mankind, human beings. Okay, what advice, we're coming toward the end mm -hmm. now in the, in the interview, uh, what advice would you give to those who might want to pursue your profession? Uh, here are students looking at this and looking at your uh, your concepts and your thinking on based on your rich and exciting career, uh, what advice would you give them? Interested in the field and uh, be persistent. And I think the three key words that I would like to say is persistent, persistent, persistent. And um, but of course you have to love this field. I love the field, whatever field it is. Um, it is good if you are interested in science, if you are interested in art as well, you have to be very, very persistent and keep working hard and uh, believe that you'll be able to do something. Okay, uh, tied into that is how important is it for a young scientist thinking about a career in science to get a PhD? Um, in current world, maybe PhD is a good training. PhD basically will train you to become an independent researcher. You can have, have independent thinking and know the methodology, how to design uh, an experiment to address certain problem. So I think PhD uh, training, um, got, uh, according to this, comp this three component, I think is critical. To, it's, it's good to have. It's very, very uh, important to have. Um, after all, high school or uh, first degree, which is the bachelor degree, uh, uh, is more on the on preparing an individual or preparing a scientist with all this fundamental background and knowledge. But uh, PhD thinking, uh, PhD uh, uh, training basically train an individual to become an independent researcher, meaning how to address a problem independently. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to work together with a group. Of people. So, would you, uh, you know, state, you know? That to a young scientist that you should get the PhD uh, as, as your goal uh, in order to really uh, sort of accomplish the, uh, your career objectives um, and get more I, respect, get, maybe get more respect or get, or get a job or get a position or get a, a, a sort of uh, people to fund a new business that you might want to uh, establish. 
Um, I maybe have to put it in this way. Yes, it's good to have. But uh, honestly, I also interacted with a number of very, very bright uh, scientists uh, from Russia, from China, sometimes from India. They do not have a PhD. But uh, I think scientists, it's not because of that paper credential. But uh, it's some curiosity that lives inside you yourself and you want to achieve certain things, want to do certain things. It's good to have certain set of training, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a proper training, say from bachelor degree and go up to a PhD and that typical uh, uh, training um, um, preparation path for you to become a scientist. But um, um, I think even if you, if you're, for example, if you have dropped out of uh, uh, high school, don't give up. And you still have opportunity to become a good scientist. But think hard, try to understand the problem, try to address the problem, and come up with in, uh, innovative, inventive solutions to the problem. Still be able to become a good scientist. Well, you you mentioned early on in, mm -hmm. in uh, one of the questions uh, you addressed earlier that you had a tough time getting into the technical universities in Malaysia. Yes. So you you didn't give up. You actually left and went to Taiwan. That's right. And that's a good lesson for any young scientist that if you get a setback and you don't get that position or you don't get that uh, admission that you're looking for, there are other possibilities out there. Exactly. Just explore, get advice, look for other people to uh, give you new ideas and, 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 and work around those uh, things that might uh, tend to slow you down. Exactly. Do give up. Mm -hmm. Keywords. Right. Mm -hmm. And that goes to your keyword, persistence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> your, your three keywords. Uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants right. in science. What, who were the pioneer researchers in your field, and what, what, what was the breakthrough that they came up with? Well, there, there are many, uh, many, uh -huh. because uh, in modern... Give us a few examples. Right, well, um, basically, we, we use all, all, all those uh, uh, theory and um, uh, concept that developed by many, many scientists. You can start from uh, uh, Newton and uh, wave, for example, the wave equations. Um, Schrodinger, describe, Schrodinger, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maxwell to start with, yeah, wait, yeah. Okay. so it start from Maxwell okay. and uh, Solinger and um, Bohr and uh, Fermi, ne Niels Bohr, yeah, many many of those giants and even come uh, close to, uh, and then to, to uh, Einstein okay. and etc. Since, so many of those. since on the wave equation we start with Maxwell, could you just explain Maxwell to right. a young scientist well, who, who might not have ever heard of Maxwell? Well, Maxwell, Maxwell actually is from uh, Scotland. He actually was born in Scotland, happened to be in Glasgow actually, the, the place that I studied. I did my first degree. And then he went to uh, Cavendish, Cavendish lab in uh, Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge and developed his career, basically developed his career, career here. Come up with a very, very good uh, four equations to describe the nature of wave, basically. Um, and now almost everyone, electromagnetics and um, even quantum theory, everything, still have to go back to this fundamental four equations to understand the nature of wave. And a very, very simple uh, um, um, application, for example, is your cell phone. Cell phone basically is microwave and how to transmit those wave and how to receive those wave. And you still have to go back to this fundamental four equations and try to understand these four equations and apply them into uh, the design, even for your the antenna, the transmitter, mm -hmm. and the receiver, and all that. So it's, uh, it's, it's very, very, very uh, uh, important uh, equations in maybe uh, electromagnetics. Mm -hmm. Because light is a type of electromagnetics. And of course, the uh, microwave, the wave that uh, you're, you're sending for, uh, the cell phone is sending and receiving, is also microwave. Mm -hmm. And the TV, if you go through satellite, light, they're mm -hmm. also sending those waves. Mm -hmm. So to understand this thing, you more or less be able to understand the nature of wave and it's being able to use it to design many useful. Explain the electromagnetic spectrum uh, that relates to what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Every single object, you can look at uh, 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 a lot of things radiate uh, uh, electromagnetic wave. Even for human beings, we do radiate wave, uh, uh, but the wave that we radiate is too small to be even seen. And the wave that we radiate is actually uh, through heat. Heat is another electromagnetic wave. You can look at it as an electromagnetic wave. Um, because our body temperature is 37 degrees C. Right? Um, so the heat or uh, energy that comes out from our body mm -hmm. basically carries certain wavelength. 
and that wavelength actually can be detected mm -hmm. if you happen to see these night visions. Uh, night, night vision, night goggles. vision goggle and yeah, camera. Right, right. You'll be able to see through all those heat. They basically detect the wave generated or emitted by a uh, the body. Even in the dark. Even in the dark. Mm -hmm. So um, of course our eye is not too sensitive to many wave. So our eye is sensitive to electromagnetic wave, which is the visible light mm -hmm. from uh, four hundred something nanometers. Mm -hmm. uh, nanometers is a wavelength. Mm -hmm. uh, four hundred something nanometers is a wavelength. So from, uh, we're only sensitive to the wavelength between 400 something to about 700 nanometers, which is the so-called visible light, or from blue color electro uh, uh, wave, mm -hmm. uh, blue blue wave to uh, red color wave. Mm -hmm. So all this, um, light wave is the type of electromagnetic wave. That's right. And so that's only a narrow band. Narrow if we band. go past that, we have ultraviolet. We have a microwave, we right. have uh, infrared and so on, and on in other, other regions of the uh, spectrum. Right, so a very, very short wavelength, for example, you're talking about gamma mm -hmm. um, wave and to X-ray. X-ray is another mm -hmm. electromagnetic wave, That's for right. example, so you can see through the body, for That's example, right. those actually is about one angstrom, more, uh, 0 right. 0.1 nanometers or so. Well, one nanometer or angstrom may be too difficult to understand. If you can try to imagine a Atoms. Atom is about two or three angstrom, which is 0 0.2, 0 0.3 nanometers, and uh, in size. Yeah, in size. And X-ray is actually uh, smaller than than an atoms. So this wave is very very small, small wave. That's why it can sh show up on a on a film. Exactly. Uh, so they show you see, the interior. It can pass through. Pass through. Thing. So and then you move to the um, uh, UV. Ultraviolet, ultraviolet. You're talking about two hundred or three hundred nanometers, uh, which is actually from sunlight. And if you want to get tan, you basically have to use a lot of ultra, uh, ultraviolet ray to 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 so called burn slightly burn your your tissue. But that will give you uh, sure, sure. skin cancer and all that. That's right. Then we have the visible light. Visible light basically is the light that we can see, mm -hmm. and you can uh, use those electromagnetic wave for display. Uh, for lighting and, 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 and all this application that we're familiar with. And then you move on to one micron or so. One micron is 1,000 nanometers. One micron or so, uh, one to two micron, you have this band. It's very important band for optical communication. So for example, um, all this high-speed internet and uh, the communication from one continent to another continent, they all will go through, and like, they're all using this wave. Like is that is that in a, in a wireless uh, or, or, or in, within within optical, optical uh, fiber, fiber. I, like the optical fiber that they have laying in the Red Sea and in the Mediterranean around the right. globe in the oceans. Right. This wave is going through this optical fiber. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So you can send wave from uh, one continent to another, go through the undersea right. optical right. cable. Right. Uh, optical fiber mm -hmm. uh, that put under sea uh, for communication. So how does that differ from what goes into the wireless uh, band? Uh, right. Is it is it significantly different? Yeah. Well, we slowly move into that now. So beyond two micron, two micron is a lot of molecular vibrations, and uh, when you move towards the microwave, micrometers wavelength, then is the, the wireless applications that we are talking about, um, and. Uh, you also have millimeter wave and radio frequency that is a longer wavelength regime sure. so they can transmit the radio and uh, this is radio FM signal. and AM radio exactly yeah. uh -huh. so microwave basically is micro micro micrometers um, sure type of wavelength which is your 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 um, cell phone or microwave mm -hmm. or so called wireless com communications uh, channel exactly exactly mm -hmm. so obviously you when you see you mentioned that everybody uh, all bodies in the universe give off uh, electromagnetic radi uh, electromagnetic radi heat yeah. generated in that yeah. body. So, like for example, all these uh, different components of the electromagnetic spectrum that you mentioned, they are all like a star, for example, like the sun right. is giving off all those uh, electromagnetic waves. Yeah, yeah. In fact, wave is everywhere. Sure. If you imagine this way, light is tough wave, and now we have. Uh, wireless signal and your microwave signal for your cell phone is radiating everywhere. Mm -hmm. So even in this room, for example, it's full with many different type of waves. And of course, from uh, star, it still emit as long as they emit light. Right. Uh, they also send this electromagnetic wave right. to the earth so that we can 
uh, observe uh, from a distance mm -hmm. and try to analyze what happened in, 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 in the, the star, in the star. By, by registering the, uh, yeah. the, the wavelengths and so on. Exactly. That's how we can determine, say, in a distant star, mm -hmm. uh, exactly the components of that star right. based on the wavelengths that are sent when, when they are analyzed. That's right. We can even find out how far away from us and whether it's moving away from us or That's moving right. towards us, right. uh, towards uh, Earth. Um, and etc. by analyzing right. the electromagnetic wave. Right. We can pick up the Doppler effect. That's right. In, in terms of the discovery of the expansion of the universe. That's right. That's right. How, tell us that how did that occur? I mean, this is Hubble's work uh, on um, analyzing the the, uh, the motion of the stars after the Big Bang. Right. Because um, they have this model saying that the universe is expanding and how to determine that. Basically, if you um, the Doppler effect, uh, if you happen to see a train coming towards you and going away from you, you'll be able to see different pitch. When it comes towards you, then have higher pitch. And move away from you, then have uh, um, uh, lower pitch. That is the phenomenon people call as redshift. Redshift, basically, when a galaxy or when a star move away from you, the light, the, the wavelength that uh, uh, you detected is basically go through a lower energy shift, which is in the wavelength regime, you now shift it to longer wavelength. So, for example, if we take a star uh, in day one and compare the radiations, meaning the signal that you receive to say uh, a year later, or maybe a couple of months later, this wavelength change in terms of peak wavelength mm -hmm. uh, of the signal will change to a longer wavelength which is what we call redshift. By using this redshift effect, um, which is um, um, the so-called Doppler effect, then be able to determine whether the star is moving away from us or moving towards us. And this is how, uh, as the astrophysicists discovered, we, we found out the universe is expanding. Right. Is that correct? Yeah, that's uh, one, one of the methods. Yeah, right. In fact, Big Bang, we still can hear the noise until today. Right. Because and of the... Background sound. microwave. Background yeah. microwave uh, radiation, is that correct? Exactly, uh -huh. yeah. That, that, that is still can be detected. So, so it's amazing, I mean, how, you know, you have some focused research in, in an area of light, which um, is looking at developing new technologies in the future and developing new uh, businesses. And you've already uh, had a chance to establish a business and maybe in the future you will establish a business in the future. It's interesting how you can take that subject and not only do practical things with it, create new devices, but it can explain the universe. It can explain uh, a phenomenon that is up until relatively recently in science was a mystery to, to human uh, civilization. So that really... Uh, sort of demonstrates the excitement of the kind of thing you say. When, when you say, I'm studying light, that on the surface someone say, well, you know, uh, what does that mean? Right. Well, it really means a lot, yeah, as you have described uh, very well here. Well, in fact, physics, especially mm -hmm. physics, is very, very, very beautiful science, because mm -hmm. uh, by using those uh, uh, fundamental theory, you can explain a lot of things and even can find out how things work and etc. Mm -hmm. So, which is, which is very, very interesting. So we were talking about those equations, just to get back for a minute. Uh, now, uh, what was the advance that Schrodinger, uh, a German scientist, made uh, in the wave uh, equations? Uh, he has a famous equation that... Uh, sure. Uh, and what, what were the implications and what was it in terms of an advance over Maxwell's uh, equation? So ba basically, um, um, in the so-called classical physics, you only you take most of the... the um, moving things as particle, and even electron, they look at it as a particle. And of course, Maxwell come up with wave equations to say that, so, well, if you want to describe a wave, maybe you can describe it in these four equations. And when it comes to the modern physics, uh, so-called quantum physics, which happened in late 80 and early 90, and they try to combine these two together, say that macroscopic objects, when it moves, you have to look at it as a particle because the wave nature of the object is too small and if you look into the microscopic meaning something very tiny and when this tiny object moves it will carry very large wavelength 
and it behaves as both particle and uh, wave. So that this is the, the, the quantum physics which is uh, Stollinger uh, equations to describe uh, this phenomenon basically come with the probability of finding an object using wave equation in 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 a wave in, in wave uh, in electromagnetic wave nature. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that is basically his contribution. Basically, uh, uh, equations that you can predict when to find a microscopic uh, object. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and when to find it as a particle and when to find it as a wave, uh, demonstrating um, itself as a, as a wave. Yeah, still still have this uh, duality. Duality meaning uh, particle and uh, wave, but both. Uh, both. But uh, it basically tell you the informations of. Uh, the chances for okay. you to find certain thing in certain area, meaning a confined area, mm -hmm. a so-called quantum confined region, mm -hmm. for example. Tie that into Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle basically say that um, you cannot have both. If you want to observe it uh, as a, a particle, um, then you have to uh, basically you can you can you can you can analyze it in terms of particle or um, a wave, but if Try to measure these two together, then uh, you will not be able to measure these two accurately. Um, that again, because uh, quantum mechanics, for example, uh, quantum mechanics especially is talking about the probability mm -hmm. of meaning the chances of certain event to occur, um, um, whether it's particle or wave. So um, um, that 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 is what his contributions. Basically, if you want to measure both at the same time, you will not be able to measure, be able to measure both in a very accurate manner. Very, very interesting. So, coming to the close here, um, what would you say is the greatest achievement that you have made so far in your profession? I dare not say that there's a, a very, very great achievement, but if you're talking about a tiny achievement, then I contribute quite significantly in a field called um, photonics integrations. It's a semiconductor photonic integration. It's a technique that we can um, um, combine or make many different components. Uh, many compo com components with different uh, functionality onto a single chip. Um, I come up with a technique uh, which I call it as quantum well intermixing. It doesn't matter about the terminology, but it's quantum well intermixing. Currently, I come up with another one called quantum dark intermixing. Basically, it's a method to manipulate the property of, of non-structures uh, non so that I can slightly change the property um, of the non-structures so that this part of the material will perform different functions, meaning optical functions. For example, we can make semiconductor laser and integrate with a component called modulator. Modulator is just basically a, comp a, a optical uh, component that modulate, turn the light on and off. We need to turn the light on and off to get one and zero. One and zero, in that case, we can then encode information into the laser. Otherwise, laser just keep shooting up the light without carrying much information. So by um, being able to integrate a so-called modulator in front of the laser, we then be able to encode information into the light signal. So um, it's the platform technology that uh, I happen to uh, uh, so-called develop or invent, um, which enable the integrations of this two components and many other components such as photo detectors. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, wave guy and are there any the practical devices that have uh, utilized your yes, this yes, technology? Yes, yes, There are actually several several companies that are using my my uh, technology. One is in uh, Singapore with a company called uh, Dance Light. Dance Light use this technology to make broadband uh, LED. You can call it as super luminescence diode. Basically, a light while well, they keep changing the band gap or being changing the the property of the material, which make a small piece of material to emit very broad and high power light. That is important for um, uh, biomedical imaging, for sensor applications, for instrumentations, and for gyroscope and etc. etc. So it become very very powerful component that they have been uh, making and selling since two thousand, uh, I think middle two thousand mid two thousand until now. The company is still 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 around, and they are now the leader of selling the so called. Super luminescence diodes, making using this this technology, meaning the technology that can 
manipulate the bank gap across a single chip or manipulate the wavelength, the emission wavelength across a single chip. Mm -hmm. There's another small company in um, um, California, in Chicago called Optonet. They are using similar technique, the technology that developed by me, to make um, spectrometers on chip. Spectrometer is a huge piece of equipment. If you are talking about the spectrometer, you're talking about the diffraction grading, the grading plate, just like a, a prism to spread out the rainbow, but the spread out different color light. Right. As we know, color the light emitted from the light bulb is by color, so you have uh, wavelength spread from uh, 400 nanometers to um, about 1 micron or so. So it's the way that to spread out those multiple color of light, but they make everything on a tiny little chip mm -hmm. by using this, this technique. Another company is a multinational company. The headquarter is in uh, um, Germany. It's a company called Carl Zeiss, Z E I S S. Uh, Carl Zeiss Meditech used similar technique to make um, broadband source for their um, um, ophthalmologist system, meaning the optical coherent tomography system. This system is what I described earlier on. Um, this technique was invented. The system level uh, uh, invention was by uh, James, Professor James Fujimoto from MIT. Um, they come up with this very niche technique to um, get 3D images from hard and soft tissue. For example, the eyeball, they can scan the entire eyeball. They can uh, hopefully in future be able to use this technique to replace X-ray uh, for dentist applications. And the system technique is from uh, a Zeiss commercialized this technique is from uh, James Fujimoto, and the component that they are using now is actually from my lab in Lehigh, um, which is the new type of SLD super luminescent diodes, um, which emit very broadband, which cannot find anywhere in the market. So they basically fund my lab to do this research, and then we uh, transfer the technology to them. If you happen to go to your eye exam, for example, after 2006, 2006, you basically use a tech if you want to study your retina, for example. You basically are using, well, because they have 90% of the market, the world market, so you most likely you're using Zeiss uh, system, system, the technology from uh, MIT, mm -hmm. and the main component, the key component, meaning the light shoot into your eye, is actually the inventions that you, uh, of you develop. Yep. So very, very, reason. very impressive. What about your company that you had uh, been a scientific uh, sure. uh, officer for and the co-founder of? What was the component that they were making? Right, we were making this opt um, photonic integrated circuit for optical uh, uh, tele uh, for telecommunication. Basically, we hope to be able to develop an integrated chip to replace a very huge system. Well, uh, for detections of light. Um, in the communication system, you have to have a transmitter, meaning the uh, system that's sending out light or signal. And you have to have a receiver, which is a system that receives and analyzes light. And we focus on the receiver sections. And in the receiver sections, we hope to be able to replace um, the amplifier, meaning you have to amplify the light to make it strong enough for detections. And we hope to be able to spread out the light, meaning uh, spread out different color because the single fiber, they usually send multiple color light through the fiber for multiple channel communication. So we are going to play these functions of amplify, am amplifying light, spread out the rainbow of the light, detections um, in one tiny little chip that is smaller than a fingernail um, instead of having one, two, three or maybe four big shoe boxes right. to make size system, devices in terms of size. Right, right. So yeah, those are the components that we're making. And um, um, we successfully demonstrate the so-called alpha prototype, meaning the working prototype. Mm -hmm. But um, um, at that time it was 2003, mm -hmm. the um, uh, macro economy, meaning the global yeah, market is right, not doing right. that well. That's right. Um, that's why uh, we, we don't survive through this, this, this so-called crisis. What future company do you have in mind of, well, of I, establishing? I, 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 I'm now working on a component that is very interesting. It's what we call it as 
uh, broadband laser, also called a supercontinent laser. Laser usually have very narrow band because you want to have all the photon group into a single energy. This is what we call laser and what we understand as laser. It's concentration of light, yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. But now I have this uh, new um, um, uh, technique of generating different type of laser, which actually give very broad band emission. And those, wave, those photon is still locked into the same phase, which is what we call coherent source, and give you very high power across very broad band. And um, we are number one in the field, and uh, we hope to be able to 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 lead this field for many years to come. And I really hope to be able to see the commercializations of this so-called broadband laser. So, what would that mean for, say, telecommunications, for example? You now have to send different color of light using different laser. But in our case, we use single laser to send multiple color lights. And if you are talking about the so-called low coherent uh, imaging technique. Just now I was talking about using the LED, broadband LED, excuse me, to do imaging. But now I can use laser with 100 times higher power. 100 times higher power meaning I can uh, make the light source penetrate deeper into the tissue rather than uh, only a skin depth of the tissue. So deeper mm -hmm. into the tissue to get more information from that particular uh, tissue then able to do a lot of beautiful things. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's also this imaging and, uh, and bio diagnosis. biological uh, di diagnosis. But also, what about in communication? Would it mean that you could carry more messages exactly. uh, in, your, in, your, in your telecommunications? Definitely. Uh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, because it's not a broader band for the internet, so to speak. Um, you can basically send more, uh, uh, more channels, mm -hmm. uh, have a single device to control uh, more channels. More channels. Yeah. Right. right. So that, that sounds like it would have enormous uh, commercial potential. Yeah, this yeah. is what I, I, I really hope right. to be able to, to commercialize. Okay, uh, two last questions. What would you describe as a typical working day in your profession? Like when you, when you get into the office, what do you do and what is your routine? What, 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 sure. you know, I'm, I'm trying to uh, think about the scientists, the young scientists out there that are listening and they are saying, well, is this what I would like to do every day? And, and, and let's, let's, let's generate that excitement on, on your day-to-day -day routine. Right. Um, if, if you are interested in doing certain things, everything that you are doing is very exciting. Um, if you, are bored, if you don't, don't like certain field, then it becomes a chore. In my case, it's quite routine. Um, here, I have to stick to the schedule of the bus, pick me up from the hotel, send me here temporarily. Right? Um, um, in... In, in my lab in the United States, I always report, I always um, uh, arrive at my office about 7 a.m. And I have to work until 7 a.m. before I go home for dinner. Um, 7 p.m. Sorry, 7 p.m. That's so a 12, 12, hour, 12 hour day. That's your average day. Yeah, because mm -hmm. um, as a, a professor, you start begins to have this international network. So the first two hours of your work, you basically reply email because uh, in average, I have to. Uh, reply at least 50 emails a day to uh, keep your network going and uh, keep everything collaborators in, in different parts of the world who are going to sleep as you wake up and exactly. so on. Yeah. And you have an organizing conference as well and as I try to do paper and all those. So I have to try to do it in, in two hours so that I can have an hour or so to meet up with my uh, PhD student and my uh, uh, postdoc to discuss about their progress and to address any, any, any issue. Sometimes it's one, two hours. And then I go back to uh, prepare some of my uh, coursework if I need to teach or uh, work on uh, paper because you still have to publish paper and etc. Then have lunch, then afternoons, you basically would then go into the lab and um, because I'm an experimentalist, I need to fix equipment, I need to design my experiment. So work alongside with the student to um, design the experiment and to set up the experiment and etc. There will be the afternoon activity. Then uh, go home, have about two hours, play with the kids and have dinner, and then uh, you start working until, until after midnight. That basically is email and uh, a lot of administrative work in, as well. In your as home? As in your at home. home, yeah, at home. So, so uh, after, you, the kids, after your children go to bed, say, 8 or 9 o'clock at night, yeah, you, nine, you're, nine. Back, you're back at it, uh, yeah. back to work, so to speak. Yeah, usually it's about 1 or 2 uh, a.m. Uh, and of course, that time can, can be
be more relaxed and sometimes read some news and etc. before you go to sleep. Yeah. So uh, that that basically the day, daily life. Um, uh, my think at it as very boring, but it's not good. It's very very exciting because um, you know have this computer being able to communicate with the whole world. Right. Basically, have friends and 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 contact collaborators all over the world. Um, which actually is quite good feeling. So it sounds like to me that you actually get two weeks work when you work one week because you are actually stretching your day out to uh, it's actually beyond 12 hours I mean because yeah, you just hours. mentioned that once you get home you you have a couple of hours and then you're back at it again so you're adding on three more four more hours oh. four more hours to the 12 yeah so we, we are now up to 16 or 17 hours uh, and um, that's that's quite a remarkable schedule. But it is on a day-to-day -day basis. It is actually a fun one. That explains two hundred and twenty papers and twenty patents. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so. And and what I also take take away from your message is that even though that seems like a lot, it's it's been like in a, a passion and a lot of fun for you to do that and to come something new. Right, right. So it's every not a, day you learn something new. It's not a drudgery. And to learn something new is the is the how should you say the key to it all. Exactly. Because that's where the excitement comes. Exactly. It goes back to your first L, uh, you know, your first uh, laser output from the semiconductor as a as a high school student, yes. and how that generated that excitement in you. So the last question is, what is your definition of success? Um, I, I, as I say, I, I'm not calling myself very successful. Uh, it's only contributed to a very small, small part uh, okay. in. But, but, but how do you define the term that you know? Apart from your, your sort of self uh, analysis think, of your own success, I'm looking at your definition. I think self satisfaction is I will call it uh, as as a very important way of gauging the success, and I don't think. It's so much on the financial or uh, any other thing, but uh, um, you grow, you see yourself gain new knowledge, learn something new every day, and um, um, that self is job satisfaction and you being able to come up with something new and um, that that will call it is a success to me. And uh, at least I try various different things, I learn various different things, mm -hmm. and uh, I can change my research. Uh, fractions I need any time I want, and uh, this is very satisfactory. Professor Boon Uy, thank you very much you so for much your interview. interview, and I'm sure that we have a lot of young scientists there who are being inspired by Hopefully. your words today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, indeed. Okay.